I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. On this episode, I'm talking to Kevin and Erica Liu. Kevin and Erica Liu have been missionaries to China for seven years. Then they got kicked out of the country and spent two years in Texas waiting to get back into China. They decided to go back on mission on the domestic field in Tucson, Arizona, where they're currently working as full-time campus ministers at the University of Arizona. In this episode, I talked to them about their experience in, in China, how they got kicked out, what they experienced there, Erica having a baby in China, not knowing where she was going to be going at 36 weeks of pregnancy, their time in Texas, and then their time and decision coming to Tucson, and what they're doing and what's working and what's not working at the University of Arizona as they work to revive that campus ministry and make it great. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Tonight on the program, I've got Kevin and Erica Liu. Kevin and Erica currently live in Tucson, Arizona, but before that, they were missionaries to China. I'm looking forward to having them share about their lives and their work here in Tucson. Kevin and Erica, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. We're so excited to be here. Yeah, to be on the opposite side of the microphone. Oh my gosh, I'm smiling so big. I've listened to that so many times and I get to see it in action. I forgot to mention it, but my wife, Pam, is co-hosting with me tonight, baby. Great to have you on the program. Ah, Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this because uh, our paths have crossed actually through the podcast and and doors have opened for you guys to come here. But why don't we start off with this question? How'd you guys become Christians? Do you want to go first? I'm sure. I mean, I came out of the womb saying Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) The answer is Jesus. (laughs) I'm joking. But I was was raised going to this church um, movement. And so, yeah, I think I knew the inevitable. Also just joking a little bit. But I went to teen camps and went to all of teen ministry activities. My parents were very um, steady in making us go to church, Mm. even when we didn't want to. I think I was probably the most uh, difficult to continue going. I think my parents prayed for me a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Amen, I'm here. (laughs) Um, But yeah, they were very steady in, in getting me to church on Wednesday nights, Sundays. We never did sports and all that. So it was really clear that this was like really something that my parents really upheld. So um, I know every time someone goes to teen camp, they, um, come back wanting to change their life. So mm-hmm. I was in eighth grade. I was a part of a, a little clique called the fine nine. It was silly, but I knew where that path was going to lead. And I was like, nah, if I'm already going to be a disciple, I already know this is like going to be a part of my life. Let's just commit. So I studied the Bible before going to camp. I decided to become a Christian. So I got baptized in June, and I went to camp, I think, like in two weeks later or something like that. And yeah, I had to just really submit my life. So nothing, I guess, riveting, but 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 impactful nonetheless. What year was that? 2007. Oh, way back. Wow. Yeah, this I think this year is my 15th birthday anniversary, so 15 wow. years. I've officially been a disciple longer than I had not, because I got baptized at 14. Wow. So 15 years as walking with the Lord. And where was this? This was in Houston, Texas. Okay. Amen. Amen. Well, I did not come out of the womb <laughs> saying Jesus. <laughs> what, what did you come out of the womb <laughs> saying, Kevin? That's what I want to know. Uh, I don't know. I Maybe singing communist songs or I don't, I don't know what I was doing coming out of the womb. Um, 
I uh, I come from a very different family. Uh, it was a very broken family. My mom and dad were immigrants from China, and they tried to make it in America. They started their own uh, like clothing design business. My mom was uh, into designing clothes. My, my dad was an artist, and uh, they started a business doing that. But when she had me, she uh, sent me back to China. Uh, so I was born in LA, but she sent me back to China when I was, as a three-month-old baby. So I never met my dad, and uh, uh, I didn't live with my mom until I was nine. My grandma raised me until I was nine. I came back to America. I was like, who's this woman that's like uh, supposedly my mom, right? Um, but I think through that time, my mom was really uh, in despair of like, you know, she left my dad. Um they had a really toxic relationship. So um, me on the other side of the ocean, uh, my whole family, my whole mom's side of the family was you know, in the communist army. My uh, uncles, my grandma, grandfather were all you know, fought in the war in, in, uh, as part of the communist army. So I grew up literally wearing the uniforms, <laughs> singing the communist songs. You know, like the Pledge of Allegiance, but like the communist versions of that. <laughs> um, so I came to America, and actually, I think my mom at that time. I remember, like, we would have Bible studies at her house. We would have, uh, we would go to church. I actually would like, like, play piano sometimes. It was very like Asian thing to do, like go to go to church, play piano. Um, but uh, all of that. And, and it was amazing because I remember as like a middle schooler, I had a natural instinct, like natural faith that like, even though I didn't grow up with any of that in China, uh, just going to church a few times, I felt like I had a feeling God is real. And hmm. I would sing worship songs just walking home. Hmm. But in high school, all the sin, all the sexual addiction, all the pride, all the self selfish ambition, like I grew up in a in a part of town in, in LA suburbs that was, I think sixty or seventy percent Asian, and then like thirty percent Hispanic, and so in that environment it's like, uber competitive. Getting into an Ivy League school was your idol, it was everybody's idol. It was if it it was not, it was weird. Uh, so that was that was my idol. When I didn't get into the school that I wanted. But long story short, I felt like God just orchestrated in my last year of senior senior year of high school everything to humble me, to really seek Him. And uh, I had so many, like freshman year of college, I had so many Christian clubs just come like into my life. They would play board games in my dorm. They would invite me to prayer sessions, just all sorts of different Christian clubs. I was frustrated because me coming from a no background, no religious background. I mean, I've been to church. I went to church like just a handful of times. Like I could count the number of times I've been to church in, in one hand, you know, throughout middle school and high school, I was interested in learning about the Bible. But as people talked about it, it always, I always felt like the outsider. Like I always felt like this is something that you grew up with and I'm too late to learn about it now that I'm like 18 everybody grew up with it who are in those Christian clubs. And so I would go to these meetings and I felt like, does everybody expect me to just become a Christian by osmosis, <laughs> like by hanging out with them? Mm. Like I didn't even know to ask to study the Bible. I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm too late. Like I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know the stories that you guys talk about. I don't know the theological discussions and words that you're talking about, what they mean. But one day, this stranger walked up to me, uh, and his name is Nick Elaine. Um, he plays tennis, so he first noticed my tennis shoes and commented on how you know great my tennis shoes were. And I love that because they were really expensive tennis shoes. <laughs> uh, they were like these Adidas barricades. And I, immediately there was a connection, and he just straight up asked me, do you want to study the Bible? And I was like, yeah. Why hasn't anyone asked me before? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Like, I just want to, I felt like God had worked a lot to orchestrate and to humble me to that point 
where uh, I was really seeking and mm-hmm. I was really lost and I, I knew my I felt my lostness uh, even before I knew the term of being what it means to be lost. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So you studied the Bible. You got baptized. I got baptized November twenty seventh, two thousand and eleven. Okay, so you're a sophomore, a freshman. I was a sophomore. Okay, okay, great. So you guys both became Christians. You as a high schooler, and you as a college student. You going to UC Irvine? Is that That's where right. you're going? Okay. That's right. They're in Orange County, and talk about how how did you guys end up getting together? And <laughs> yeah. I mean. How'd you, how'd you guys meet? Mm. Um, or maybe I should ask the question, how'd you guys get to China? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how'd yeah you we get met to in China. China so. Yeah, right. how'd you get there? So at that time in Orange County, Southern California campus ministry, uh, everybody wanted to be an intern. Everybody wanted to be in ministry. And uh, that was me. I wanted to be in ministry. I wanted to learn and to be trained. But there was no room for me to be an intern. So... Uh, I was like, after I graduated, the campus ministry had dwindled on my on UC Irvine campus to be, just be like me and my roommate, only brothers and like six, seven sisters. And so I just felt really a fire of I was converted in campus, so I want to help out in campus. And uh, at that time, it was Chaz Centennial. Uh, that was leading campus and and uh, I just was like let me do let me just be self-supporting let me uh, work a full-time job I can still lead a Bible talk on campus I did that for a year it was really hard I would be trying to write Bible talks as I'm driving back to campus after a full-time job and you know, a couple times I almost um, got into an accident but it, it wasn't fruitful uh, it was very difficult and uh, I remember like like crying on Chaz's shoulders, like, like Chaz, like, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. Um, but prior to that, I, in my, just in my junior year, after being a disciple for about a year, I, I would hear stories of people going to places and doing things and in places like Eastern Europe, the Middle East. And it, it would sound awesome because it felt like they were really relying on God. It felt like God was really doing things through average, normal, everyday people, through a small group of people, disciples. And that was really attractive to me because I had my, admired my leaders so much that it almost was like leader worship. It was like my campus minister, my uh, evangelist, my worship leader, even my household leader. I felt, I felt like... I felt like <laughs> I felt so much respect to the point of like admiration to the point of like, can I ever be these guys? Mm. Um, so I just felt like, well, let me, when I heard these stories, I want to see God working more than just man working, more than just charisma, more than just man's personalities, more than just man's power. Mm. So when I saw that we had churches in China, it, it was really intriguing because I grew up in China and all the churches in China said undisclosed location, undisclosed location. It was a black box. So I, it, it just intrigued me even more. And when I when I heard that there was a one-year challenge website, I had this mentality that I thought to do something great, to go somewhere, my church leader had to tap me on the shoulders and say, Kevin, you are worthy now of, <laughs> of, of going somewhere. I think, I think you can go out and do something great and be a missionary. Mm. That that tap never came, <laughs> but when I when I stumbled upon the one year challenge website, I was I I literally clicked on each and every single site, watched all the videos, read all the descriptions because I was like, you mean I can just apply, like I can do something out of my own free will to like <laughs> choose where to go and and on faith, I was that was that blew my mind. I just stayed up watching all those videos and applied to each and every single one year challenge site. And uh, I got so excited. I, every day I, when I was riding my bike home, I was singing, uh, you know, there's a song, like, send me out. And I was so excited. I was going to quit school and, and just go sophomore, uh, junior year. But then the advice I got was, no, you should finish school. So <laughs> be responsible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's where I, 
after I graduated, I felt like I needed to stay on my campus and help. I didn't go to China right after I stayed for a year, but it wasn't fruitful mm. when I stayed to help out campus. And um, that's when I, you know, I felt like a dead end. I felt like I didn't like my job. I felt like unsuccessful doing self-supporting campus ministry with very little training. And I, and so that's when I texted Kelsey, who was leading the one-year challenge site in China. And I said, you know, hey, can I still go to China? Is China still open? And I could never forget his response. He was like, yeah, are you ready? This was like two years later, two or three years later, we haven't talked. And all he said was, are you ready? I was like, yeah, I'm ready. And, and two were, years after. Uh, so initially I contacted all the one-year challenge sites on that website. And uh, I had a good talk with Kelsey, but I but later on I told him I'm not ready to go go to China or go anywhere yet because I feel like responsible for helping out I my see. campus okay. ministry. Okay. Um, so yeah, after that we talked some more, and uh, the rest is history. Okay. Wow. How about you? How'd you get there? Um, so I feel like I um, first kind of got interested in international missions. My parents were on the Eurasian Missions Board for a little bit. Um, when I was in high school, a sophomore in high school, and um, they took me along to go to St. Petersburg, Russia, to like kind of they were going to advise. I, I don't really know what they went for, but we were in a lot of meetings. I do remember that. <laughs> I was the only um, daughter that was still home, so they I got to go, which is was it just really changed my life. Um, it was my first time seeing a church that had been planted by like twenty people, and it was like. I think it was close to like 400 people. I mean, it was crazy to me. And it's, I think they planted it, you know, when the communist regime fell there. And so it was God's timing, but it was just, I mean, it was, it was amazing to me. And I was just like, I was a sophomore, did a disciple for about two years. And so I just, man, I thought I'd go back to Russia. Um, I really loved that time. I was really impacted by the disciples there. I graduated college in three years. And, um, I thought about taking a semester off to go do like to go to Russia, but it just didn't work because my, my, I studied filmmaking and digital filmmaking. And so the program they have set though, is if you take a break, you're really delayed. And I didn't, I, I think some people have an affinity for Asian culture. That just wasn't me. I mean, I didn't not like it, but I just I never in my mind would I thought I'd go to an, a- an Asian country, let alone marry an Asian man. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I applied. I think my um, my disciple at the time told me, like, just apply to um, the one-year challenge. Like, why not? Just be open to one-year challenge, go apply. And I did, and it was also kind of similar, like, wow, this is so cool, so many, like, places. This would be amazing. There was, like, I think New Zealand was on the list at the time, and I was like, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go see what Lord of the Rings was. It's going to be beautiful. Almost like a one-year vacation and, and put it and douse it in like Christianity. <laughs> um, it was really exciting though. So I just, I applied. And um, now knowing what I know, <laughs> I know that they the one-year challenge site is run by somebody in China. <laughs> so whoever applies, they're the first to respond. They're like, they, they give you a pamphlet. Hey, you, you didn't say that you were interested in China, but here's our information anyway. So they were the first to reply to me. And I remember opening that email and telling my mom, man, wouldn't it be crazy if I went to China? (laughs) And we kind of laughed. We were like, ah, it was like her birthday dinner. And (laughs) we just kind of put it away at the Cheesecake Factory. I was like, that's silly. (laughs) And then, um, but they're relentless. I mean, man, Belsey, Belsey is really relentless there. So (laughs) he, um, they emailed me. And so two sites, again, I worked for the website for a little bit. So I, I saw the back of it. And um, a lot of a lot of these churches that are on one year challenge site, they really need a lot of help. And so they can't always support people. Um, I think when people apply to one year challenge, they think like, the church can support me, they'll pay me. But the reality is churches, these they, they can't. I mean, they're just they're struggling already. And they need people to come help but they need self supporting people. So um Anyway, I, I was graduating college. I didn't have a job yet. I mean, I just, I I couldn't like self-support myself. Like I didn't have savings to go on, if that makes sense. So, but in China, it was a great situation at that moment because they wanted, they wanted English teachers. The jobs, a lot of the English teaching jobs 
are not so intense where you can't do ministry on the side. Like you can support yourself while you're working there and the cost of living is low. So you, you could tutor even, um, and survive on tutoring. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of like a perfect situation, if that makes sense. And I just, I applied really early actually. And I had talked to the, the leaders there and, um, I didn't, I didn't really want to go <laughs> at first. <laughs> um, so I talked to places in Europe, I remember, that were pretty open, but they had filled the slot because I applied really early on. Like I applied, most people apply, they're ready to go within a few months. I had like eight months to go, um, but I was just so excited. And in that time, I had first applied. My dad had gotten leukemia, so I wasn't quite sure could I even leave. We had some family drama. Like, it was just a lot going on, so I wasn't quite sure could I go on a one-year challenge. I don't know. But um, anyway, so um, I wanted to reapply because when it was actually coming close to to go, a lot of more sites had opened up that looked nice. (laughs) And so, but I knew, I knew that the leaders in China ran that side <laughs> so if i reapply <laughs> they'd see yeah mm. so i wanted to be honorable about it so i I emailed them and i was like hey i really want to reapply because it's like getting closer can i reapply to see who i matched with because it kind of matches you up with people who are like oh you know do you have some money saved blah, blah, blah. and um he was supportive he was like yeah go ahead you can you can um you can reapply it's fine but just so you know like we would still really love to have you in china like we really need you And I felt convicted by that email. He was like, let's have a call on Sunday. Let's talk one more time. And I was like, oh man. But before that even call, I thought, am I going on a one-year challenge for me or am I going on a one-year challenge for God? Mm -hmm. Like if a place is already saying that we need you and I can, and it kind of works out, right? You have a job, like it it, it can work out. Am I just not going because of me? So... I I prayed for God to give me a very clear sign. My parents make fun of me to this day about it, but I'd go on prayer walks in the at the arboretum. It was winter, and things were melting. So I was like, God, if a drop of water, just a drop of water, falls on my face, I'm going to China. And I go pray. I like pray to the sky, looking up to the trees. Like, okay, here you go. Here's a drop of water. Come on. And it didn't happen because I wanted to happen by Sunday because I had that call. Like, I'm gonna tell him on that call if I'm going to reapply or if I'm going to go. And then I remember I distinctly going in my apartment, I drink a glass of water and I put it down and my friend is like, you have a drop of water on your face. And she said those words to me, like not you have some water, you got some on your face. She said, you have a drop of water on your face. And I said, are you serious? She says, yeah. And she's like, kind of looks at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to China. <laughs> I'm going to China. <laughs> I'm going to China. <laughs> And she was like, what are you talking about? I run to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and sure enough, it was a drop. And I was like, I'm going to China. And like, I think it was so silly. And so I, t- I remember telling my parents that. And they're like, you went to China for a drop of water? I'm like, it's faith. It's faith, y'all. It read it in the Bible. It's a faith move. But um, but yeah, so that's that's basically, that's how I got there. I mean, that's silly, I know. But I love that. It's really how I got there. And, you know, it, when you're there, you just man, you feel on mission. You feel like you're needed. Like the weight of how many people are lost. It just crushes you almost. I mean, it's it's impactful. And I mean, in a very sad way, I mean, really, it's very sad. I remember praying multiple times, like weeping, because it's just, it's like almost an impossible mission. But you feel like you with the house church mentality and with, with the people who you, who go with you, you really feel like, we're in this together and God is going to use average people. Like Kevin said, I think the average person is just used and it feels like you're spiritually healthy. And I got physically healthy there too. And so it's just a really great place mm. for me to be. Mm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Something that like, um, I noticed. So every summer I would come back from China and just visit family and Erica too, almost every summer. Mm. And I would, I would notice that I felt more and more empowered just as as an average person that I felt like I could do more and more ministry. But then like, I would hear people say like, oh, you know, I'm not cut out. I'm not cut out and do ministry. And I look at them, I'm like, I I feel like you're more cut out than me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it really has to do with when you're there in China, like everyone is on mission, and you really feel the need, mm. uh, and it, it it empowers you in a way. Mm. That's awesome. Okay, so how did you guys get together? Who liked who first? <laughs> I want to know. We've was debated it like, about this a little yeah, bit. <laughs> do you? Was it like Sparks for Sight? Who was there first? I was there a year before Kevin. Okay. And I always feel grateful to God because I lost 50 pounds in that year. And I felt like, oh. thanks God, threw me a bone. Five zero? Yeah, I lost 50 pounds my oh first my year there. Oh, my God. You just walk in. And at that, t- at that time, again, it's changed since then. But at that time, there was no takeout. There was no taxis. You just walked and biked. And I just would walk and bike everywhere. And you just, I mean, I didn't have fast food. Like, I mean, everything was just a total life change. So I just felt like God threw me a bone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, like, I think Kevin loves me no matter what, but I felt really good. I felt healthy. I felt good. I felt confident with myself. Like, yeah. So I think it just helped me. And then I got some good discipling. I was nicer. <laughs> <laughs> So I was grateful for that year up on Kevin, because when Kevin came, I was still kind of mean, but did a little bit better. (laughs) We met Kevin. I helped pick up Kevin from the train station um, when he came in. I just thought, oh, this is like the new leader's kind of protege, like his new favorite. (laughs) Yeah, I. but I don't remember our first interaction. I just remember picking him up and being like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was a group of people, group mm-hmm. of brothers and sisters, who picked me up from the train station, mm-hmm. and you, know, you were one of them. Mm-hmm. But we didn't really talk. No. The, our first interaction was going to the street food together. Mm-hmm. The night market, yeah. With another sister that came the mm-hmm. same year for one-year challenge. Mm-hmm. And uh, it wasn't love at first sight. No. It was, uh, I actually felt like, a little bit like... Taken aback. Oh yeah, I was a little bit rude. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin asked the general, like, "Oh, what brought you to China?" And I just, but a good, good, good question. But in my like, I don't know, my prideful mind, I'm like, if he really wants to know, he'll ask. But like again, so I just the general answer, I was like, "Yeah, God, God brought me here," <laughs> <laughs> and I left it at that. And Kevin was like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm really grateful though. I think for house church because uh, we really we saw. It, I mean, that wasn't the only interaction. No, no, uh, that was the first interaction. But after that, I mean, we would have running club on Tuesday. We would eat lunch and outreach uh, every meal. We would have midweek Wednesday. We would have Bible study on Thursday night. We would have like a fun activity on Friday. We would have frisbee on Saturday. We would have church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. So the only day that we didn't see each other was Monday. And right. even some even some Mondays we would have household time together. Like yeah, like yeah, we saw each other every day. So we really became really good friends. Anyway, he asked me on a date to to uh, an amusement park. It was so much fun. We it, I like Halloween. It happened to be Halloween time and we just chatted and I again like foolishly I just had this like great idea that during a date when a brother would talk to me, I would stop talking to see if they noticed. <laughs> which that's why would I do that? But I did that. Cause I was like, if a guy cares and is listening, he'll be like, Oh, what were you saying? But I would just stop and see if they would like pick up many guys actually never noticed. So I was like, Oh man. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, but I did it with Kevin and Kevin came back and was like, Hey, what were you saying about this? And I was like, Oh, you're listening to me. <laughs> wow. But wow. it was so much fun. I had the best time. It was a great first date. Yeah. That's when, for me, I was like, this is totally, this is a great friend and a great companion. So Mm. that was like my first kind of sparks. But that was months after knowing him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think, I think from there, we, I don't know who, who liked who first. I I think it was about the same time. Probably around the same time. Yeah. 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 And then we dated for six months and I proposed on her birthday. Mm Mm-hmm. Very romantic proposal. And we had uh, like a three-month engagement, mm-hmm. and then we were married. Yeah, nine months total. And wow. you got married in China. We got married in China. Yeah, wow. my, our families came. We got married in a, um, a traditional ancestral home, so like very traditional Chinese buildings. But we had a Western wedding, and it was it was beautiful. I mean, it was a it was a great wedding. I mean, it was my wedding, but it was really fun. It was really beautiful. It was really 
Wait, memorable. When was that? February 17th, 2017. Okay, so five years ago. And did your parents come over for that? Yeah, they did. They were they were elated that I was getting married. Um, they were super supportive. My sisters came. They all came about a week early because they had not met Kevin. Mm-hmm. Um, they had met him on Skype. But that was about it. I mean, they had not met Kevin in person. Um, I, Kevin talked to my family when we were dating, but we had just not met him. So they came a little bit, like, tried to come earlier to meet this guy. Hmm. That's neat. That's so awesome. That's so cool. That must have been such a victory for the house church. And I mean, how many weddings had there been? I mean, oh, so many. Actually. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? We were like one of nine. Wow. What? Yeah. In that time, there was a there was a, there was a wedding every month. That we were getting, and then now we all have babies, but like, yeah, wow. during that time, because I think like, it was very balanced of men and women. That was very intentional. We really tried to reach, have equal balance. And then because a lot of people started dating, it just like activates, I think, people's mentality of like, I also need to find a partner. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, there was like people dating all the time. People wow. got married. So we were, we were, I think it's nine. Am I wrong in think, saying that? I don't know. Yeah, it definitely felt like a wedding every month. Every wow. single month there was that's a wedding. So there was, cool. I remember a wedding before us and a wedding after us that we went to. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Kevin, I was talking recently to a person who knew you in China and she was, she was there with you. And she said, man, if you had known Kevin, I can't believe how much he's changed. He is so different. I said, what, what do you mean he's different? He goes, he was such a wallflower. Mm. He hardly ever talked. So, I mean, to, to meet you now, it's totally different. It's hard to imagine that because you're so, you're outgoing and gregarious. And what happened? How'd you change? Yeah, I, I also have a similar memory even before a meeting going to China, meeting that person, I had a, uh, I remember it was the first Devo campus Devo that I, I was some somewhat in charge of. I was in charge of like just a prayer at a park. And I remember I was so not confident that a visitor that came to that devotional publicly said the person like without naming me, but in front of everybody saying, I think the person who's leading this should be more confident about themselves. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and it was, she was a visitor. So I went home uh, after and I just prayed. I just prayed, God, uh, make me a leader. And I felt like he answered that prayer. And I, I felt like definitely there was training involved and uh, there was just maturing. Uh, I think just being in the kingdom matures you when you go on encouragement dates, when you, I, but in the house church, every brother has to know how to lead song. Every brother has to know how to lead a communion talk, how to lead an offering talk. Like every brother has to do something. So I, I definitely think the training, that training helped, but I, I really think God answers prayers. You just got to pray for it. You got to pray for God to transform you. Mm-hmm. It can't be just by man's power. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, one of the blessings recently we had is a year ago, Kelsey and Jelaine came into town and you know them from China and um, they, they trained you guys mm-hmm. for a number of different years. And, you know, Kelsey is a person I respect so highly. Yeah. And Kelsey and Jelaine are just amazing couple. But one thing that that stands out to me about them is that they're very intentional about their training. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got a mm-hmm. way to do it. They've got a pattern. They've got a system <laughs> yeah. for sure about what they do and what they don't do. And mm-hmm. they're they're very intentional about that. Can you talk a little bit about that training and what you learn from them? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even know where to begin because... <laughs> It's kind of odd to to be with a couple for so so long. I mean, we were, we were we were with them for like seven years. Yeah, I think. yeah. Um, wow. We a were kicked time. out together. We were in Texas together. Then we came to Arizona together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, I think first he taught me how to dream for God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. 
I remember having this talk of one of our first discipling times. He said, Kevin, what do you want to do? What do you want to do with your life for God's kingdom? And, you know, I thought, I said, I noticed people in the kingdom are usually of one of three types. He said, uh, I, I, so I said I could either be, you know, like an evangelist type person or like a teacher type person or like uh, a serving the poor type person. And he just, he, he just looked at me and he said, why not all three? <laughs> yeah, do all three. Sounds like him. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think there's that dream part because every one-year challenge person that comes to China, he would do an orientation week. Mm-hmm. So there was there would be like the fun stuff of exploring the land, learning how to use a chopstick, learning the local restaurants. But then at the end of that orientation week, he would literally show a PowerPoint slide of all the the kinds of people, all the like ethnic, ethnical people in China that are unreached. It's a, it's a why we're here talk. Mm. And it would just slowly play through all these faces of people that are unreached in China. And uh, it, he talked a lot about like numbers of ratios of un, unreached peoples versus disciples in certain places. Where are the frontiers? Not only about China, but also uh, just the world at large. And he talked about like thinking of us as a sending out church, of if we're if we're able to keep our church small by sending out, we're successful. We're, um, just so I think in that way he's given me a conviction about missions and a conviction about what to do with my life. So that's the dream part of it. The practical applic- practical step part of it. Uh, I think he's very good at like stepwise training. I remember because I'm Chinese looking, uh, but also American. Uh, the advantage of being an American in China is people want to be your friend if you're American. Like it, especially if you're like a redhead, you can walk onto a basketball basketball court just to play a basketball game with, with Chinese guys. And everybody wants to be your friend. Your phone would be like a vacuum. You would just start vacuuming their contact <laughs> information and everybody would want to be your friend. So I'm not like that. I'm, I'm, I look Chinese. So, but, but Kelsey was like, talk to people in English. Like use your American side of it because you'll be more influential in that way. Because I do, when I do speak Chinese, I do sound like a five-year-old. So like <laughs> people can't figure out why does this guy sound like a five-year-old? Like, <laughs> and my accent is good enough that I sound like a Chinese person. So I just kind of sound like this person without any education. Mm. <laughs> um, so I mean, who wants to be that person's friend, right? So it's like, if I, but if I just say, if I say something in English, something very simple, like, hey, are you a student here? With just like a like no Chinese accent, people would be like, whoa, 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 "What's what's happening?" You know, I want to be your friend. Like, right. I, don't, I want to figure this guy out. But I was so timid in, in doing that because I was like, "This is weird." Like, I look Chinese, I can speak Chinese, but you wanted me to speak English. So Kelsey would say, "You know what, Kevin? Don't don't even worry about talking to anybody. Just just be in the right place. Go into the canteen and sit there. That's a victory." <laughs> So I think his training was very step. After like several times of just going to the canteen, I'm like, okay, I need to step out on faith. I need mm-hmm. to step out and open my mouth and like make a friend. Um, so it was very like, it was very, um, it was gentle, but it was also firm. Like he needed to take action, but he knew that sometimes to reach the next level of your faith of what you think is possible, you need middle ladders like middle runs on the ladder Mm -hmm. to get to the next step i mean that's just like one of the things i mean yeah yeah i mean the dream part is a really big one i think for me too like being with them just you just yeah it's just like that they really can their love for mission is just contagious i mean that talk that they do in orientation the last one there's like not a dry eye in the room Mm -hmm. because they just share their own sacrifice. Like we also have children in America, but we think this mission is more important than that. And it's just really like convicting. I mean, it's very convicting. So that is probably like their dream and their sacrifice. It's something that we really admired. And I think we're trying to try to learn from, Mm. um, I just never had seen that to that level. Wow. Like I had not growing up in like a larger church. I just, 
our, my, my home church at that time just really wasn't that I knew of. I mean, maybe things were going on. I just didn't know, but hadn't really sent out a lot. So like, I just didn't know that sending could be normal, but being there and, and seeing like, yeah, like we stayed about a hundred because we constantly sent. And so it was just really encouraging. And I mean, even I think it's funny. I, I, when I think about things I've learned, I think about, um, like little phrases. They always have these little phrases for stuff too. <laughs> like one of them is like, if you're doing it right, you're saying goodbye. And so that was like when he'd be prepping for us to split because we'd be too big as a house church. And mm -hmm. so he'd start preaching that like, you know, you're doing, you're, you know, you're doing it right when you're saying goodbye to people. And I'm like, yeah, now looking back, I'm like, he was just prepping us to say goodbye to our friends. Cause it's true. Like my best friends that I went to China with, we ended not in the same house church because we got too big. We had a split and, um, Eventually, one of them went to go lead in another city. Like, it's just a bummer, but but, but great, right? That's a good victory, mm. but really sad at the same time. And um, yeah, they had like just so many little phrases. I can't even, I had one of them in my head I can't, can't think of. But um, yeah, I felt like they, they taught me how to, how to, how, like what discipling looks like even, like what healthy discipling, discipling a whole person, not just a legalistic point of view, but really like wanting you to succeed. Hmm. I remember like one of his first lessons that when we were there was like, take vitamins. <laughs> How can you help people if you're not healthy? Hmm. Um, and that wasn't like a regime of like how to be healthy, but it was just like, you have to just realize like you need to, you need to be healthy yourself to really help hmm. other people as well. And I mean, obviously we're never perfect in doing that, but just he cared for people. Like they really cared for people. They really hmm. loved people very wholeheartedly. Hmm. Um, that's something I really learned and, and really how to be patient with people. I think they were really patient with me hmm. um, coming in like 20, 20 years old, maybe 20, 21. And um, just being patient with who I was at that hmm. time. Hmm. And I remember being corrected very gently by Jelaine, but crying like Three, three times I can remember on her couch crying because she's like, hey, you're kind of mean. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, she didn't say yeah. that, those yeah. words directly, but just, just she discipled me. I mean, she really helped me in my character mm. to grow. Um, but she did it with so much love. Mm. And I never, I think Satan would try to get in there and be like, these people don't really love you. But, but I could always talk to her. Like, mm. Just taking it with grace, if that makes sense. Like, mm. I don't know, but... Just really being my friend. I mean, we're, we're, I'm old enough to be her daughter. I mean, her daughter and I are close at age, mm. but she just loved me anyway, mm. would be my friend. Mm. So I think that was just like I really learned from them was like being friends, being open, how to, how to really be on mission, mm. how to be healthy, how to love the Bible. I mean, they're really Bible scholars there. We did for our Wednesday nights, they were just for disciples and we did Old Testament surveys, apologetic classes, how to grow your house church, love one another series. Like they did a lot of deep Bible teaching. Mm. Again, I had never, never did that. All I had heard my whole life was topical preaching. Mm. They did expository. I mean, they just really were like, if you love God with all your mind and you, you would go to school and study, why not just study out some of God's word and know him better? Mm. Why is all that's in the Bible? It's there for a reason. And so, and I just, yeah, I just, oh man, I just been so impacted by that. I really mm. grew in my knowledge of God, really understood the Bible mm. um, a lot better. And, and then that has given me a lot of confidence to give an account to people of like, like questions of like, where would you turn to if someone asked you this? And I'm kind of being stopped in my tracks and like, I don't, I don't know. Mm. But now I feel like I, years of that, I'm like, yeah, I would turn here. You know, mm -hmm. like I just, it just like solidifies my faith, right? Of having more knowledge. Not that, again, that's the only way. I mean, because he would say, could someone uneducated make it to heaven 100%? Mm -hmm. But why not? If God's given us this, why not just mm -hmm. learn more? So I both of them, that. great stu students of the Bible. Really, really amazing. I feel like that, that was just really encouraging to be around. You guys got kicked out of the country. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Nope. Illegal. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I uh, I had a service, Sunday service, where it was a kind of a special Sunday service. There was a holiday called Qingmingjie. It's, it's tomb sweeping day where you traditionally would worship your ancestors. But... Uh, obviously, we don't want to do that as Christians. 
So we would gather the Chinese disciples in a special service and teach them how to not not worship your ancestors, how to not do this holiday the traditional way, but still do it in a way that honors your ancestors. So I went to that service because I looked Chinese and that Sunday there was about 16 of us and all the foreign disciples were going to have a separate Sunday service, night service. All the campus disciples went on a retreat somewhere. So it was, it was just like a 16 of us, single young professionals, Chinese service. And we had a knock on the door by uh, people who said, we wanted to check your gas for safety issues. And uh, they came in, They as they were walking out, they had, their eyes were like, wide weren't blinking they took out their phones took pictures of us because we had our psalm books and our bibles and our notebooks out and uh this brother was preaching so i was like okay that was weird they left and i that should have raised a red flag for us but it didn't because i think in the past those group of churches we've never in other parts of china things have happened persecution has happened where it broke out and the people had to leave. But for that, for our group of churches in that part of China, we never had to had that kind of persecution. Mm -hmm. we, we were always able to get out of it. Like one time we baptized this, this uh, brother in the ocean. There was about like 40 of us, 30, 40 of us just celebrating. And then my roommate was leading the baptism. Preaching. And, like preaching. And then there was police standing right behind him, hearing everything, watching everything. And my, my roommate didn't, didn't understand why as he was talking our faces were worried or anxious he thought maybe he was saying something wrong <laughs> but it was just because the police was standing right behind him but even then like we would have we were able to talk the police out of arresting all of us um, yeah, my sister was like yeah you can't even bring us all in we're too many people you got, you're a small city we're like yeah that's right we can't really like, bring you like <laughs> we're not doing anything wrong and then the police would be like okay yeah so that very sisters. persuasive, yeah. you know, sister. But so in that situation, we were like, well, yeah, nothing would happen. Like we, we, we were always able to get out of situations. Uh, but on that Sunday, the, the police came. It was about like 10 to 15 policemen came in, took us in vans and uh, took us to the, to the police station. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, so that's what started it. Yeah. And... Then we lost our jobs and lost our visas. We went to and got another visa. Multiple visas. Multiple visas. Then we lost that one. I was pregnant at the time. Then we then Sprayed Erica it. lost her job. Then we got another visa. And then I, I even forget how many times. But yeah, well, well, you got a little bit lucky. You got one visa on based on my visa. But I had to find a job. No one wants to hire you when you're pregnant. If you're foreign and pregnant, you just have no rights. Why would we pay you to be not on, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, I mean, local people have six months maternity leave, but foreign people just don't, they don't have anything. You'll lose your job and you can get it back when you're done with being on maternity leave, whenever that, whenever you decide. But that lost, yeah, I, I lost my job. I had just, because I was pregnant and I had worked at this job for five years and I was like, I really want to have a family. Do you got like can I can I somehow stay? They were like, Yeah, sure. But then after all this happened, Kevin lost his first first job, first visa. The police called his job his school, lost that job almost immediately. And um my contract, I was about to go in to sign my contract. They knew I was pregnant. I got like three bosses to okay that it's okay you're pregnant. You can keep your job because your job is linked to your apartment. You can keep your apartment. Cause I had found like someone to take my classes. So it just worked out. On the way to go sign, he called my boss. Calls me and he's like, "Hey, I'm so sorry, but my boss is saying I can't hire you because you're pregnant." But I know that's not true. I mean, I had gone jumped through all these hoops, but but thankfully the leaders were like, "You guys want to just leave this area?" And I'm like, "Please," because at that point I was four months pregnant at least, maybe six. So we moved to a smaller city. I had to find a job though to keep a visa. But no one wanted to hire me. But then, thankfully, I found a company to hire me. But my previous job lost all of my documents to um, 
like my, my, but my diploma, which you have to submit an original diploma that's notarized by the secretary of the state. They lost it. Like they didn't have any of my paperwork. They couldn't find any of it. And so this new job, my parents, bless their hearts, drove to Houston from where they were living three hours, one way to go get paperwork two times to get me like all my paperwork to get this visa. I, they, they do it. We get all the paperwork in time because my, my, my visa is, is running out. I'm nine months pregnant at this time and we're in a new city, small city. She's like, we just got the paperwork. Let's go get your visa right now. I'm like, yes, amen. We go to the immigration office. We give him my paperwork. At this point, Kevin had already lost, like we've lost our jobs. We knew there was some problem, but we were just hopeful because Kevin had gotten a 10 year visa, a spousal visa. So he was able to come and see me, no problem. So I, I'm the only one now that doesn't have a visa. We go sit down. There's there's a problem on the screen. Woman's like, hmm, this is interesting. Leaves and doesn't come back for a long time. And I'm like starting to sweat because I'm like, this isn't this is abnormal. Something's wrong. Comes back in a completely different demeanor. So rude. She's like, you cannot be here. I'm not giving you a visa. And I'm like, what? My my boss, like the lady who's helping me, is like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? She's like, she can't be here. She's she's not she's not allowed to be here anymore. And my boss is like, like fighting with her a little bit. Like, what, what are you saying? Give me information. And then finally, she's like, she's nine months pregnant. What are you talking about? She's like, she can go have her baby in Hong Kong. She can't have her baby here. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, and so she's like, why would this happen? I and then I, I've worked in this company for twenty years. I've never seen this. So they called us in that night, and we told them like, well you know, months ago, three months ago, two months ago, something like that. We, my husband was in, trying to be the innocent side of it. Like my husband was Chinese service, didn't really know. And they were like, yeah, you guys, like, you have to leave. You have to leave to have your baby somewhere. And so, um, I got another visa. <laughs> I went and got a tourist visa and, but it was only 60 days. So at that point, I like, it'd be too short. Like I could stay to have my child, but then one more entry on 30 days. So one month postpartum, but then like, when does the other visa come in? So we decided to just use the, that visa, like use it up before I had my child. And then Kevin, but Kevin decided, I want to try one more time to get a tour, a 10 year tourist visa. Let's go to Hong Kong. At that point I was 36 weeks pregnant and it was the last chance to get a visa or else I had to fly back because flights won't take me. And so we went to Hong Kong and we sent our passports, I guess illegally, to America to reapply for a visa one more time. With the Chinese consulate in America. Yeah. like Hoping that they would be more lenient. Yes. Like we could try to get away from it a little bit more. Um, and we called it a baby moon. We're like, let's just go on holiday. Hong Kong really supported us. It was really, it actually was a really good memory. Um we got the visa. We got a 10-year visa. We didn't know how we felt about it <laughs> because we just felt like, what, what's going to happen? But then, I mean, I had my baby in China. I think God really blessed that decision. It was an incredible experience. I mean, um, at 36 weeks, I found another doctor, a new doctor that would take me in a private hospital in China, and they were just amazing. I mean, it was a really great experience considering what it could have been and my parents came to see the baby and to be there for the birth. And then my Kevin took, my sisters came for Christmas. Kevin took them out of the country, quote unquote, to Macau. Technically it's China, but you have to exit to go see pandas. Ironically, the pandas weren't, weren't there that day. <laughs> they came back in and Kevin made a joke of like, oh, they always pull me aside to question me. So, and sure enough, he was the first one. They pull him aside to go question him. And my family comes back in and they wait for like 30, 45 minutes and he's not coming back out. They can't find anyone to tell him what's going on. My mom and dad, my sisters don't speak a lick of Chinese. And I think people are, the, the immigration's a little bit lying to them because um, they're like, oh, we don't know. We don't speak, we don't speak English, but they're in the immigration office. Like you have to speak some English there. Um, and finally they call me they're like, we can't find Kevin. No one knows where he is. And I was like, what are you talking about? At that point, my son was, our son was three months old. And I couldn't leave because we didn't have a visa for him. And so they call me and they're like, but we don't know where he is. No one's telling us anything. Um, and I was like, you make a scene. Like, they need to tell you. I mean, they can't just disappear somebody. What does that even mean? Like, I, I, cause I had called advice. I'm like, what do I, what do I tell my parents? Like, you make a scene, get an answer. So finally they made, they kind of pitched a fit and they, one guy came over. He's like, oh, I know that guy. He's not, he's not coming back. 
And then I was like, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> postpartum, like still super hormonal. Like, oh my gosh. Like totally had a panic attack. Um, but Kevin calls me. He's like, I'm in Macau. They released me. It's fine. Like they took some stuff. They, but they rejected his visa at the border because it's a valid visa for 10 years. But they just like completely canceled it. They stamped canceled on his visa and he's out. That was the first indication that, like, this is real. Like, we cannot get back in again because we had to try. I mean, we, I think there was a piece of us that just kind of felt we can always get another visa. We can always get back in. Like, we'll just keep trying. We'll just keep fighting this. Because, again, we personally had not seen this kind of persecution, like, follow through. We've seen threats. We've seen calls. But we had not seen follow through like this, organized follow through. So, um. Yeah, that was like a really good indication. So in about 21 days after that, I had to quickly get a visa, an exit visa for my baby. But I had to go to the immigration office again because I had to tell him I'm still here. I have a baby now and he's a visa. I got fined. I was questioned for a little while. It was very scary, but I mean, it was very gentle because again, a nursing mother, I'm nursing in their, in their waiting room. And um, yeah, I sold it gave us some time because I knew if I exited, I would not be able to enter too. Cause they, when Kevin was questioned, cause he did not mention in that detainment, that first detainment, they were detained for nine hours and him and two other brothers were questioned. And in that questioning, Kevin, they showed Kevin a picture of me and Kevin and Belsie and Helene <laughs> together. I'm like, Oh, you know, these people. And then we're, and we're labeled. So they knew, they knew what we were doing. I mean, they started having a file on us. So, we kind of just, it just all kind of came to fruition. So we knew that my time was coming up too, but it gave me enough time to sell everything in our house, give everything away. It was very, I remember leaving the country, like going to Hong Kong because I, I everything's packed up. My friends are going with me. I have, a, I have two sisters that are just so faithful friends, came with me, exited the country with me and to help me with my baby and the stuff and the bags. And I look over and there's an old man wearing Kevin's shirt. Mm-hmm. Kevin's like old shirt that he had brought with him and one of his first shirts that he brought to China <laughs> because I had given away so much stuff and finally I was like I can give away some of these ugly shirts <laughs> like we had a, only had a couple suitcases left but yeah there was an old guy wearing an old Chinese man like hogging a loogie on the side but wearing Kevin's shirt <laughs> Kevin's red blue striped polo shirt I mean it's just like so ingrained and I just thought that's fitting that's fitting that this man's wearing Kevin's shirt like, that just feels right <laughs> That's intense. Sorry. Kevin, how did you feel when you're getting detained for nine hours? I mean, weren't, weren't you afraid? So I was afraid mainly for the local disciples because I had been told, I mean, the worst thing that can happen to me is getting kicked out. But I had been told that uh, the for the China, for the communist government, the kind of churches they want to eliminate in China are underground churches that have some sort of connection with churches from outside of China because they don't want a foreign influence in in China. Uh, So by me being a foreigner there, it showed that this church has some sort of connection with outside. So I was just afraid mostly for the local disciples what's going to happen to them. But just like when we got detained, when I was in the van, like a newly baptized sister was like uh, trying to comfort everybody, trying to be like, hey, it's going to be okay. Uh, when we got to the police station, uh, a brother stood up. Like like at, when the police is not there, the brother stood up, read a scripture out loud to encourage everybody. It, it really felt kind of first century. It's, it was really cool, actually. Um, and, you know, they didn't like, harm us in any way it, it actually they were on the surface very polite and very nice and treated us like cordially they gave us food because we were eating our lunch when they came in and detained us so uh we kind of just let the time run by we had like basically you know eight hours of fellowship but it was it was kind of like it felt d- like daunting at the same time, because we know there were two brothers being constantly questioned. We don't know what's going to happen. So we're just sitting there waiting to see what's going to happen. We don't know how long we're going to be there. We don't know what we're waiting for. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were waiting for the religious bureau to get to get there to question us, to talk to us, 
to make us sign a statement that we're no longer going to be participating in religious services and stuff like that, uh, which I didn't want to sign that statement. And uh, if you know, all all churches, all underground churches in China, when they're caught, they have to sign that statement. And some churches, some people don't just refuse. And so, but I, I, I just didn't know what to do in those times. I didn't know what to do because they, they, they took out a Bible too. They, they, they said, you know what this is? And I'm like, yeah, it's a Bible. They said, now put your hand on the Bible and tell me where your leader lives. Oh. And uh, I, I said, so I put my hand on the Bible and I was like, oh my gosh. Like, they're like, yeah, you can't lie, right? You're a Christian. You can't, you can't lie to me. I mean, I wish I had the courage to just, just be like, no, I'm not going to tell you. But I, I felt like I, I don't know. I felt like kind of like Abraham and Sarah. It just felt like a lack of nerve of like, what's, what, what are they going to do to me? You know, what are they going to, not to me, just, just to me, but what are they going to do to these disciples? And also like, I wanted to stay in China. Mm-hmm. So I felt like. Uh, if I if I somehow gave them what they wanted, they would let me. They would not kick me out. They would not. It, it would just pass. The thing. This thing would just pass. Mm. So, for the for the address, I was I was just like waiting to see. I was just like trying to buy time and think about how can I answer this question without saying an outright lie, but also give them what they want. So I you know I would scroll through my phone and I thought you know I can give them their old address, and I just I would just say. Instead of saying, "Hey, this is where they live," I would just say, "Hey, look here," and then, like implicitly imply that this is their address without saying, without lying, that saying this is their address verbally. Uh, with the statement, I would just say, "I just, I just wrote in English, like I understand this this thing that's written on my behalf," but I wouldn't say I'm gonna follow through with it. Um, but the police would read it and say, oh, "My English is not very good." But it sounds like he's saying he's understands what is written on here, but doesn't agree to it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And then like I, I, I don't, I don't even remember what I, what I, how I did, what I did to get out of that. But I was just, um, I think in the end, honestly, I wish I went out guns blazing <laughs> because I don't. It, it's like. It, it, it wouldn't have made a difference. We were kicked out anyway. Right. <laughs> I wish I was like the apostles and just like preached my heart out to these people and just was like, like my, your will or God's will. What do you think is right to do? Mm. Um, you know, but I, I didn't, I was more like, you know, like Abraham in a, in a lack of nerve situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when I was at the border, um, they checked me for drugs first because the border police had a didn't really have all the information that the religious police have, so they had to wait for that information to come. So they they their guess when they searched through my backpack and found my Bible and notebook, their guess first guess was okay, this is somebody like a, a missionary, foreign missionary working for the church. They asked me just point blank, "Do you work for the church?" And at that time, we were full time, uh, uh, minis- in full time ministry, and I was I said no. So I lied, but I, I wish, I wish I just, I wish I just went out guns blazing, you know, mm-hmm. like really, um, yeah. Cause I, I, I think God is in control. Uh, having gone through all this, I, I gained this conviction that God, God can take care of us and is in control, um, that I don't need to manipulate the situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you left the country, you ended up in Tucson for a year or not Tucson, but Texas. Mm-hmm for a couple of years during COVID mm-hmm. and then you chose to come to Tucson. Why did you come to Tucson? The Rob Skinner podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at the time we came back, we lived with our, with my in-laws, with Erica's parents. Mm-hmm. They had a nice casita. They, <laughs> le- they lent us their car yeah. indefinitely. Yeah. We decided to buy an RV because we we definitely desperately needed our own space. Mm-hmm. I was working for Amazon, just packing packages uh, and sorting packages. And the one thing that like really propelled me forward, other than the Bible and spiritual books, because 
uh, even though you're not supposed to really like have have earbuds on when you're working at Amazon packing, but every everybody was doing it, and, and <laughs> it really actually helped me to keep my spirits up. And and then I stumbled on your podcast, and it was just every day at Amazon, like you're uh, working ten hour shifts for four days. So I'm listening to your podcast like for like a good part of that ten hours of the day. And uh, I don't know, hearing these stories of people that um, like they had lows in their life, they had trouble in their life, they, but they, they still kept the dream alive. Mm. It, uh, it really encouraged us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like when we got to Texas, I just, I feel like I tanked a little bit. I mean, hopeful at first. We kept saying like, oh, in two or three months, we'll go back. Or in two or three months, we can figure it out. Two more months later and... Yeah, I just tanked. I like just did really bad. I um got kind of depressed. I just just didn't know what God was doing. I didn't understand his purpose. Like what what's the point? Why are we like cuz then COVID happened, right? So like we're kicked out. Can't stay around the country cuz COVID shut everything down. Come back to America, everything shuts down again. We have no close relationships there. My parents are like discipling us, which I mean bless their hearts, but that's that's hard. I mean, you know, like and we, I think, I remember my dad coming in the room and being like, hey, like, it's really sad to got to see you guys hang on so tightly to this dream that's just not happening right now. And I just start crying. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, what do I do? Because this is all, like, we, we planned on being there for 15 years. I mean, we thought when our kids are in high school, we'll come back. And so just like that being shattered, it was really difficult for us. And then I mm-hmm. think for me to like, just no, no friendships. Mm. And the sisters, there's a few sisters there that really tried, but again, it was COVID. So like, mm. it was just, it was just like no one's meeting together. I think it would have been different if like everyone was meeting on Sundays mm-hmm. and Wednesdays and I could get to know people better. But like, this was just locked down. So like, I just saw my family and it was, again, it was fine in the beginning, but just got really, really lonely and really, really difficult. So I just, and then I got pregnant by accident. And to me, like, I just thought this is another, like, either I'm going to have another pregnancy that's just up in the air. Because, again, I didn't have a doctor until 36 weeks who I knew I was going to deliver. That was really difficult for me for my first pregnancy. I did not want to do that again. Mm. I want a different experience. But then Kevin, I think when I was, like, three months pregnant, he's like, let's go to Hong Kong. I'm like, Kevin, I don't I don't want to. Like, please, like, let's just. <laughs> I was just begging us to, like, settle. But Kevin wasn't ready to settle either. And the art. The RV was my idea, and at first he was really against it. But then I think because it, we could move it and we could put it in storage and, and quickly go back, that was like what sold it, and then um, like sold the idea. And so I just I just really really struggled. So I got pregnant and I got really sick when I was pregnant. So just like miserable. Uh, every time I open the the, the RV door, I throw up. Every time I exit, I throw up. I mean, I was just throwing up constantly. Kevin's like cleaning up, so much throw up. I just was not in a good place mentally. And so Kevin coming back and like listening to the podcast, I mean, that was for at first to be totally honest, I was like, I don't care. Like, can you just, can you just be quiet for a little bit? (laughs) I never said that, (laughs) but I'm like, can we please just like live our life? Like, can we just stay somewhere and just not, can we please just, just embrace Texas? I wanted him to find a job in Texas. I wanted us to get a house in Texas. Like, let's just, let's just put roots. Let's just be done with this. And um, thankfully, Kevin did not do that. And so he was listening to the podcast. And, but then we would start driving. They started having church in San Antonio. We were in San Marcos. So they were in San Antonio. So about an hour drive for us. Mm-hmm. In that hour drive, Kevin's like, let's listen to a podcast. And we listened to your podcast. And um, he'd make me. <laughs> and so it was good. I mean, it was good for me, though. I, I, I mean, Frank and Erica Kims was also very memorable. I think Erica shared she really asked frank to pray for her and i was like did you hear that kevin you need to pray for your wife to have a dream you know like (laughs) these little these little snippets i remember crying with kevin about listening to lynn greens i mean that was really impactful for us because they played in hong kong i mean they're like great like founding fathers of china right spiritually speaking for our movement and we cried in that podcast together. I mean, we just have a lot of memories. I think really positive memories listening to this podcast, which is silly, I guess, now that we're here. But um, but not really. I mean, they're really great. We really appreciated it. I mean, yeah. it really kept us 
just someone is dreaming and someone's doing okay, you know? <laughs> like, it's not us, but someone is. <laughs> <laughs> and but, but on your podcast, it said, um, you said, we're planning Flagstaff. Because right. Kevin and I started talking like, we need to go somewhere that is open to new ideas. I think we just felt we wanted to be used. And we, I think knowing what a mission team is like, mm-hmm. we know like... Small house church. We know on, well, on a planting, everybody has a role. Everybody's being used in some way. Everyone's mm-hmm. signing up to go. I mean, like, it's just like you're signing... Like, every, it's a different mentality. Right. So we were like, let's see where mission teams are in America right now. We mm-hmm. can't go to China. I, we don't really want to like, leave the country. Where can we go in, in America? And there was none. I mean, Flagstaff was the only one being planted. And your podcast was like, if you want to come for three months, we'll take it. And again, at that time, we were not ready to commit to being anywhere. So that was really encouraging for us to hear. Because I think when, when people move into a ministry, if you want to leave in three months, I think people are like, okay, enjoy your stay. But they don't know how to use you. And I, I totally sympathize with that. So we're coming in Texas and we're very vocal about wanting to go back to China. People are asking us, like, consider staying. We're like, nope. Sorry, like we're leaving. So I'm, I, I sympathize a lot because they, what do you do with somebody who's there just for three months? Mm-hmm. Like, we don't know us. Who are we? I, I grew up in Texas, but again, like who I was in high school versus who I am as a, like now is very different and right. amen. But like, uh, I just can imagine like, yeah, who are you? You know, like who are we? And, and we're not really this charismatic couple, I guess, that fits this leadership role looking type people. You know what I'm saying? So like, I sympathize. So when you said that, like about, oh, we'll take you for three months. We're like, that's where we want to go. And then we looked at the weather. That's the first thing we do next. Look at the weather and then housing costs. And we're like, oh, Flagstaff is crazy expensive. We can no way afford this. Hmm. And that was kind of like a bubble pop because we were like, oh, no. But Kevin had called you and, and talked to you. And you guys were very supportive of us wanting to go there. And I think at that time, we were still with Belsie and Helene. <laughs> and um, they they were like, what about Tucson? And I think I was the only one in that group who was like, nah, nah. <laughs> I don't want to go. Ooh. Yeah, I was like, I don't really want to go there. Like, I don't know. Like, let's want a mission. I was very set on mission team. And so I was the only one who was like, I don't really want to go. But then, I don't know how we how we landed on it. <laughs> it worked. Well, I think <laughs> Rob and I talked, and uh, he said, "Could you come and help campus? Hmm. Could you come to Tucson?" Hmm. And so I applied to I applied to a job in at NAU. Yeah. I applied to a job at U of A, and I got pretty far in both interviews. But the, my boss at the U of A at the time was for like an IT support job. He said to me, uh, he called me back and he told me, you got the job, but it, you weren't going to have the job two days, two days ago because we, we, we didn't have your position open. But just two days ago, somebody decided to quit. And so now we want to hire both. Like you weren't our number one choice, but you were our number two choice. So we, we want to hire both you and the number one choice. And he said, you know, you believe in God, right? Like, this seems like a very <laughs> bad thing. Um, why, so, why would he say that? Because he, one of the interview questions he asked was uh, something like, what kind of difficulty or hardship or challenge have you had to face? And I just laid it down on the table. My <laughs> wife and I, we just got kicked out of China. And, you know, the whole pregnancy thing, the whole visa thing. And so... You know they know they know that I was a missionary, and, you know, and and my boss was like, yeah, we knew we I had an inkling you moved here for church, not really for this job, <laughs> but <laughs> that's fine. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, you just started leading full time. Yeah. I mean, you you still you still have your job that you had last year mm-hmm. on campus, but it's been reduced to just eight hours. Eight sure. hours. Eight hours a week. How's it going? And what's your what's your plan? Mm. Good question. I I think it's been going really good. I think it's been really encouraging to see so many people open to studying the Bible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I think 
uh, tabling, giving out EGs. We have this thing in Tucson called <laughs> EGs. It's, it's hard to describe. Um, like slushies. slushies. Slushy. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the right thing for Tucson. So uh, it's kind of magical. So we're, we're giving it out and we're just talking to people as people are coming to our table and asking them, where's your journey at in your faith? Where's your, where's your journey at? Where are you at in your journey with your with walk with God? And just try to see, have a sense. Is this person a worthy person? Is this a person, an open person? And just from that, uh, every time we table, we get about uh, 30 to 50 numbers. And we would just follow up and follow up and follow up <laughs> and invite them to Bible studies, to, to devotionals, to church. Mm-hmm. And God, I think God has just shown us the harvest is so plentiful. Mm. You just you just need workers who are willing to love people, who are willing to show people the word, who are willing to meet people where, where they're at, and the harvest is so plentiful. There's so many yeah. people that could become Christians if we had just workers uh, who are willing to lay their life, lay their life down for people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think my plan... My plan is to keep tabling, keep, <laughs> keep <laughs> outreach. Start. I do start thinking about okay, like all these friends that were coming, if they all become Christians, um, they're gonna be our campus ministry is gonna be too big for our house church model midweek. <laughs> and, and I do think about I do you know listen to all the podcasts on campus ministry that that you've done, and I do I do think about like how come the best campus ministries all cap about a hundred mm-hmm. while there's, you know, 50,000 campus students, 60,000 campus. Why can't we in a city have a campus ministry of a thousand? Mm. Mm. Wow. And there's no reason why we can't because we know how to build a campus ministry to about a hundred. So why not just duplicate that? Why not mm. have two Alpha Omegas mm. on a campus? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Three Alpha Omegas. Why, yeah. can't, why can't we have five campus ministers? Mm. And so I'm, and I think the reason is because once you get to a certain size of a hundred campus students, um, you you re- to raise up another leader, it's 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 just hard to do that all of a sudden to split and become two different campus ministries. So I, I, I've been thinking about, you know, how to apply mm-hmm. what we learn in China to really exponentially grow campus ministry mm-hmm. here in America. Mm-hmm. And, um, wow. but yeah, I think the plan is to really raise up leaders early mm-hmm. leaders who are capable of discipling, capable mm-hmm. of leading Bible studies, capable of preaching yeah. early on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, for me, we have like three girls, and right now, this week, I have four Bible studies, and I'm like, whoop, that's it, like <laughs> that's all I can handle right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, because I mean, really, every day is like it feels it feels packed. I mean, mm-hmm. and you have two little kids. I do. I have two little kids, three and one. They're the cutest. They are. Um, They're so cute. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so I mean, amen. That's <laughs> I, yeah. I also can think like, oh my gosh, like how how do we how do how does anyone do more than this? I really every time I listen to one of these the campus ministry podcasts, I'm like, let me hear like, come here, some girls. Like, what are y'all, what are y'all doing? Like, <laughs> so, like moms out there. Like, <laughs> how are y'all doing that? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like it's been really encouraging. I mean, last mm-hmm. year, kind of coming in for me, it was just different. I was really reluctant. Um, I felt like a mess. Um, Kevin was really ready. Like he felt like he was being a slingshot ready to like just be shot and just go. But for me, I was really, um, really reluctant. I just felt like I don't want to do this. I don't really want to, I don't really have a heart for campus ministry in America. I don't have a heart for campus ministry in anywhere in the world. (laughs) I just, I just felt like I want to, I want to be a mom. I want to, I want to meet mom friends and I want to play times and just really do outreach that way. So it was hard for me to reconcile this, um, but um, I think because last year we only had two girls, three, I guess, with an intern, and um, it was pretty, like, easy, if that makes sense. Like, it wasn't very demanding of me at that, mo- at that time. We had one Bible study, one, one disciple, and one intern mm-hmm. for women. Yeah. 
So it was, I felt like for me, that was what I needed. Like I just needed a very soft, soft start. And, um, it was good. I mean, it was good. It was encouraging. And then that says that girl who said the Bible got baptized and, um, now she's a part of our ministry this year. And, and I feel like this year we had a lot of people move away or graduate or something. And so it just feels like, I don't know, like it, it's like, like we have some foundation here because mm. last year we really just took our time. We tried to do it the China way, to be honest. We tried just making just pure friends and just doing it just the China way. I mean, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work in some sense. I mean, I think it was for, uh, I think for with this situation it was probably needed um, because here it was just coming into a different situation. So, but it just built this foundation of, of trust. We just built kind of reestablished convictions. I felt like, mm-hmm. And then, yeah, well, l- let me ask about that. How did, how are you doing the ministry differently mm-hmm. here in America at the University of Arizona versus what you were trained in in China? Mm. Yeah, in China, was, you uh, make a friend, you eat with that friend, you play frisbee with that friend, you do that for a month, and then you pull out your Bible. You say, hey, this is my favorite book. Uh, this is my you know, things I've learned from it and you just share. And then from there on, you study the Bible with people. So it was very slow, but because we were doing that on a bigger, on a, a higher volume, uh, we would have uh, just a lot of people studying the Bible. But I, I, so like trying to do that, it was, it was kind of people like here at the U of A, it's like getting together to eat. It was kind of weird. Like there were a lot of things that worked, but that doesn't work. That worked in China, but it doesn't work here. Mm-hmm. Like just just sitting next to somebody while they're eating and trying to be their friend, um, and then asking them out if you want to come, you want to eat again. It's it's weird. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> um, There's like no like canteen dining halls. There's one area to eat. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. It's just a little weird. And then. Even with Frisbee, Ultimate Frisbee, we would have a lot of people come out. Yeah, very successful in getting people there. But like setting up a follow-up appointment of, hey, want to be friends? Outside of Ultimate Frisbee, uh, it was like also kind of weird. It was, was, you know, not successful. Hmm. So... um, what was your, what, what, did you have a question of what, what is working? Yes. Yeah. How, yeah. how have How's you had to change or, or adapt coming yeah. to a different mission field from from the foreign mission field to the domestic mission field? Yeah. So I felt I felt like as I started talking to people and sharing my faith, I paid more attention to the things that they were asking me. Like I mean, I was still cold contact share, uh, but people would ask me, "So what what is this?" Or like, "What are you a part of?" Or when do you guys meet? And as you, as you do enough cold contact share, you, you start like, like people always ask you these questions. So I realized I really need to be very front and center of, of who we are. Like the name, people really care about like what, what campus organization are you? Mm. So, so the front and center, I even remember like Nick Elaine coming up to me and he was like, I'm part of Alpha Omega. That's where a Christian ministry on campus. It was like people somehow remember their, the name. And then then it establishes, okay, in people's minds, what category person you are. Mm-hmm. You're, okay, you're a campus minister. Oh, you're a campus minister. Oh, you're, you're about teaching the Bible. Okay, like it removes a lot of like uncertainty of like, why do you want to be my friend? Mm-hmm. Why do you want to ask me out for dinner or lunch? <laughs> why do you, what is this Frisbee group for? So that's one thing I noticed. Um, two, th- the second thing I noticed has been effective is, uh, asking people out for coffee. So I don't, I think I, d- I don't really like coffee, <laughs> um, but I started noticing this. I, I, I kind of attribute it to different things. I attribute it to just, uh, hearing people do it and the campus ministers do it. I, I, oh, my wife doing it. Yeah. The, one, 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 I remember. Day, we're like, we're one like, day. So Will Lambert in San Antonio, he does this. He, you know, when he helps someone get become a Christian, he posts on his Facebook page like the process of how it happened. And it was actually very helpful because when I read it, I go, okay, wow. It's like 
like implicit training here. Like he says, I did this, or like this person, we did this first. We we went out for coffee first, then we had a Bible study. And I was like, okay, let me try that. Let me try asking people out for coffee. And I I haven't had a person say no hmm. to me when I just asked them out for coffee. So, um, I I think coming back from China and doing the ministry China way, I felt a lack. Like when I did it the China way, it didn't work. I felt a lack of confidence whether I can really be influential in these people's lives.、Mm. But、uh, being able to get with people one on one and share and really get to know the person and talk to them and share my story, ask them for their story, and open the Bible, I realized like like it really is the Word of God. First, it really is the Word of God that changes people's lives, and two. I I do have a changed life that I can share with people, that no, whether whether no matter where it is in the world, like it will impact、right. people,、yeah. it, it will、right. resonate、that's、with、powerful. people, it will influence people. That's right. Yeah, you, you had you came coming out of COVID. The campus ministry here was weak, and I would guess it's it's impacted. I know from talking to people, it's impacted campus ministries across the country. But it, the campus ministry here was small. It was weak. It had gone down to three disciples at the beginning of this school year, and can you tell about how it's how it's going? What are you seeing that's looking positive? What's working? What's not working?、Mm. Yeah.、Um, so we've had three kingdom kids come in into our campus ministry. So then, just by that, like we double, we double. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 yeah.、Uh, so that was really encouraging.、Um, I think, like, so that for that part, teen recruiting is、uh, is kind of important. It, it, I kind of got inspired by the way that University of Arizona, our football coach, was trying to recruit people onto the team. So I was like, okay, I, we need to do a good job of also recruiting Kingdom kids、mm. to come into our campus ministry, especially when it's small. It、right. makes a big difference when、yeah. you have、uh, numbers. So、um, I think. Just from、uh, at, at WDS, I talked to Kyle Plum, and he said, "Dude, Kevin, it's not rocket science. <laughs> you got, you just gotta share your faith, and you just gotta set up appointments with people. You just gotta treat it like a full time job, like eight to five. Share, share, share.、Mm. You're gonna find open people, and I don't know. Somehow that talk is just like." It blew my mind and simplified things in a way where I'm like, okay, well,、wow, that's that's sound, that just like simplified it. That just made、mm. it super streamlined for me. I I just need to do that. And so,、um, even before we started tabling, like even before school started, I just I just decided for that week, I still had like a seventy five percent. Full time, seventy five percent job working for the U of A as a web developer. But as I get off work from that job, I just I just made a decision. I'm gonna share with the first person I see.、Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna do that. Like it doesn't matter if they're in a group. It doesn't matter if they're sitting down inside. It doesn't matter if they're sitting down outside. It doesn't matter if they're walking with their friends. It doesn't matter if it's a group of three. It doesn't matter if it's a group of five. I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask them if they want to study the Bible.、Mm-hmm. And it was just so encouraging because, like, doing that for about like just an hour, you could get about ten numbers, ten、mm-hmm. twenty numbers. And I was like, Kyle Plum was right. <laughs> <laughs>、um, and so,、uh, I think from that, from that, and from tabling,、uh, we've gotten probably like、uh, like five, six guys studying the Bible. Two, three girls studying the Bible,、um, and then this past Sunday, one, one of the one of the guys was baptized. Amen. And it was really encouraging because we it felt like we have a pipeline of guys because as soon as that guy was baptized, two other guys that came on that Sunday said to each other, "Hey, we want to get baptized." Like, <laughs> and people started. We would we would in Tucson Church we would do these.、Um, Cards where people write down 
uh, contact cards and say like what, your name, your email, your phone, and what's your next step? What did you, what should you, what should we pray about for you if you want to pray for? And like people will write down, I want to get baptized. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So, um, yeah. Can I, I for me, yeah. like too, I think like um, one thing kind of to loop back, I guess, but like in China, I really learned how to be a friend. Not just an, like I think in my campus ministry experience was cold contact, cold contact, cold contact. If you're interested, great. Not bye. Like, and then my close friends came from people who were keen in kids or or already disciples, and we had a pretty established church, our established ministry. So like about thirty maybe, but I'd say majority were keen in kids actually mm-hmm. deciding to go there. So I don't know how to do American campus ministry to be totally honest. Like I don't I'm not, I don't really know. Um, but in China, they really teach you how to like persevere because you're investing in someone for a month, and it's it's hard when they say no because mm-hmm. it's not just an investment of like, but you really love that person after right, a while. You've right. spent so much time with them. Right. You go running together. I hate running, but I went running for them. <laughs> we play frisbee. Mm-hmm. They're at my house. Like, there's a real investment there of love. Mm-hmm. And so if they choose to walk away, which a lot of them do, it's really hard. Mm-hmm. But that really, really taught me how to like persevere with people and like not be afraid of someone who's not really open right away. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I feel like translating that here, I just learned how to be <laughs> quote unquote normal. Like mm-hmm. I can make a friend without having this expectation of like, yeah, if you don't come to church, you're not my friend anymore. Mm-hmm. But it's... It's just a healthier, like, I want to influence you because my life should be different. Mm -hmm. My life is different. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that made a huge difference. Even with my last year, I really pour it. I feel like I try to pour into people because that's what we learned. It's just pour into people, showing, like, bringing them into your life. And so for us, it just really was helpful to kind of tie this China to, to America because, like, if you're studying the Bible with somebody and they're coming to church, Wednesday and studying, but all you're seeing them is just all of these spiritual talks. Like you need another, you need to be their friend too. Like just going running or just coming over to my house and having, having that coffee date or not just that first initial one, but like, how can you still be my friend? My parents are generous. They gave me a membership to the zoo with my, with my kids, but I can bring some with me to the Mm -hmm. zoo. So the amount of girls I brought to the zoo in the past couple of years is Kind of a lot, actually. But it's like my go-to now. I'm like, hey, you want to go to the zoo? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, okay, let's go. It's small, but it's fun. Yeah. So I think like that was, that's been helpful for me is like, how do I just be friends with people? Yeah. And I think that's something that we really want to try to like teach people too of like, yeah, there's a side of campus ministry that is cold contact. We can't ignore that, right? The amount of people we meet cold contact, it's just night and day for us because the amount of people I'm having Bible studies with this year is so different. I think part of it is because our cold contact sharing. Right. But then, okay, if you don't love that, okay, but are you friends? Like, right. we need friends. Right. We need to be a light to the world. We need to really love people. Yeah. Like, are we really loving people? And then loving them enough to love their soul. Because, right. like, right. there's also that fear, right? You love yeah. someone if you want, if they say no to church, but yeah. you can't shove it. But, like, you can't shove down their throat of, like, church. But at the right. same time, you can't just give it up. Right. You can't just let it go and be like, oh, they're not interested anymore. Like, you have to just continue, like, touching back to this of, like, if you're friends enough, you should be able to say, have you really thought about this? Or, like, right. just taking, like, looking for those chances that God's working in their life that mm-hmm. you can be in step with the Spirit with, I feel like. Yeah. Sorry. So this is kind of no, a side note. No, that's so good. All right. I got to ask you guys, where do you see yourself in five years? In which part of Tucson? Are you going to be <laughs> buying a house in five oh, no. years? Woo! This no. is tough because you guys know. are our uh, bosses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this past summer we we wanted we started a dream again for foreign missions, and we can't go back to China because uh, we're probably on a blacklist somewhere. So it's this is actually this question came from your your interview with with Lynn Green because when they decided to go to Hong Kong. Scott, Scott asked themselves the question, uh, what's the most radical thing we could do with our lives? Mm-hmm. And so uh, we, we went on a website called, it's called the Joshua Project. It has statistics on the places in the world where people are most unreached, the number of most unreached peoples. And we just took that graph and just sorted it by population. And so we pray, prayed 
and prayed and prayed and talked and talked and talked and looked into like top like top countries in that list so we asked ourselves several questions of like because we felt like we've been trained in a, in a way to dream to plant churches mm-hmm. uh, we've been trained to do underground house church um so we asked church in, house church in general i right, feel like it's right, been right. really impactful for us so i think just wanting to get get back to that to be honest and we we, we felt like inspired to start a one-year challenge site like uh like the kind of training the kind of inspiration that we receive from just being in china we want to do the same thing we, mm-hmm. we want to inspire people who who graduate from college and uh don't know what to do with their lives there's so much need in in in, in outside of america for missionaries even just a year i feel like the whole idea of one year challenge is is really a, a beautiful idea because if everyone gave a year mm-hmm. i think it could be really impactful mm. big time just yeah. one year right. i mean like I, I mean now granted in china most of us stayed <laughs> for longer than a year so i understand like it's a heavy it's, it could be a heavy ask but but really though i think like when people come and just give a year even if it was stateside i mean mm-hmm. it would just it would be different though yeah. like, that's interesting you bring up the the LDS church, because I think that's where they are way ahead of evangelical, any other churches that I know of in terms of a two-year mission coming out of high school. I think it's just absolutely brilliant. And I wish all of our churches did that. I mean, that's one thing I really encouraged my uh, middle son, James, to do when he graduated. Mm. And he actually went went uh, after his senior year to Japan for a year. Mm. It was so awesome yeah. for him. Mm-hmm. But I go, that's such a critical time. I and mean, you do so much growing up. You come back, you're ready for college, and you are a different person. Yep. Yeah, and, totally. So, I mean, I just I hope other people will, will um, adopt that. One year challenge, two year challenge. I think it's, it's super powerful. Um, so, you were talking about where you want to be in five years. <laughs> right. You didn't get specific. So, where, where are we talking? <laughs> so, I. I you know, we ask ourselves, what's a country where people can come and be missionaries, where we can set up a one-year challenge? What's a country where we can really glorify God, where there's a great need, where uh, it's a radical place that really needs God? And so uh, we looked at Turkey. We looked at how it's a Muslim country and it really needs missionaries. We thought of a place where we, a place where we felt like if we wanted to, plant a church we wanted to be a sending out church where where will we plant roots to do that and i mean just yeast of turkey you got iraq iran you got syria you got uzbekistan kazakhstan pakistan you got all the stands <laughs> yeah. um, and i just go i just dream of just turkish missionaries i just dream for that area of the world i, I just go I, I personally need a dream that I would die for, that I would, that I could see my pouring out everything, pouring out the rest of my life for. Mm. And, um, and so I, I, I just think about that. And that's awesome. Yeah. Now, my next question is who's going to replace you? <laughs> <laughs> One more question of the hour. But the question was in five years, honey. <laughs> that was the question. Well, the people that are going to replace us are, are the listeners, the listeners of the world. <laughs> if you are thinking of campus ministry, <laughs> please consider Tucson, Arizona. There you go. There you go. That's right. Well, what advice would you guys give to those who want to make this life count? I had this scripture pulled up this whole time during our podcast interview because I knew this question was coming. <laughs> and, I, you know, I listen to your podcast in john 14 12 this jesus says very truly i tell you whoever believes in me will do the works i have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because i am going to the father and i think when you ask the question how to make this life count uh how to live a life with no regrets there's no life like doing the things that jesus is doing and even greater things Mm -hmm. that is a life with no regret that is a life that's that counts mm. but the next thing that jesus says is what is is my advice is he says he says next 
I will do whatever you ask in my name. Yeah. So my one advice to make this life count is to learn how to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember sitting at a campus midweek and it was uh, Fred Fowler from Boston, a teacher from Boston, right. showed us lesson on prayer. And it just blew my mind of like, am I even praying? Mm -hmm. Am I really praying? And I went out and tried some of the things that he suggested and it just rocked my prayer mm. prayer life. Because that one hour lesson, he said, well, it's actually a three hour lesson that I condensed into one hour. So I went I went to IPI and I bought the three hour because it's like a three set CD. But I just feel like that prayer lesson changed my prayer life. Mm. And I, I just feel like I, I'm just a man. I'm just a jar of clay. I can't do anything. I can't change hearts. I can't build churches. Uh, I can just pray. And Jesus says, if you want to do greater things than, than these, you got to ask in my name. Mm -hmm. You got to learn how to pray. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think on um, when I think about this, I just really, I, maybe it's just my recent conversations a lot, but you have to really train yourself to listen to truth. There's just so much filth that we take in mm. and we internalize and we just think like this is what's true and it's not. And I think like we can't make it count <laughs> if we ourselves are not listening to what's true in our life. Like what, what's, what's God's word say? What is truth? Mm. It's so relative, but it's not. I mean, Pilate even said, right? Like what is like, what is truth? Right. Mm. And so I think there is, truth and we have to really listen to it listen to god's word really be inspired really be moved by that because nothing else is going to propel you it's not like to make it count i mean nothing else is going to count if you are not rooted in your truth like in truth in, mm -hmm. in the word of god and if that's not your your reason for doing what you're doing then it's going it's going to crumble mm -hmm. It's just going to crumble. And yeah. so I think like for me, like that was a lot. That's why I, that's why I need to hear, you know, mm -hmm. like I I so easily can get bombarded with what other people are saying, what other people think, what other people yeah. feel, mm -hmm. like all of it. I, I get again, I get so deeply insecure about stuff, but I, I have to remind myself like what is truth? Yeah. Am I listening to that more than I'm listening to other people? I mean, I, mm -hmm. but I feel like just making your life count. If I'm going to make my personal life count, I have to live it for God and I have to know why I'm doing this because like even the idea of going abroad again, when Kevin brought it up to me, I'm like, no, <laughs> my family's close by. Why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. But then there's that, there's that deepness. I feel like, but I do want to make my life count. I mm -hmm. really want to be useful and, and be on mission for God. And mm -hmm. we all need to be right. Yeah. And so yeah. I think like, I just need to be reminded of, Okay, like, what's the Bible say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's that truth? Is that going to yeah. reign? Is Jesus Lord of my life today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is He Lord of my life of my future? Is He is He going to help me make my life count? So mm -hmm. I think listening to truth and really being in the Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, Kevin and Erica. Thank you so much for being on the program, and thank you for coming to Tucson. Yes, thank you so much. It has been fantastic mm -hmm. to have you and Kelsey and Jillian. Last year, I know they went back to China, but. This has been one of the most exciting starts to a school year I've ever experienced. Probably, in my mind, the best ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just so hopeful and so uh, pumped up when I see what God is doing in the ministry here. It's, okay. it's thrilling to see it growing, to see the excitement building. You can just tell the Spirit is really working. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I look forward to having a podcast with not only you, but also some of the other guys that are working on campus, Felipe and Ed, talking a little bit more in depth about the technicalities. Or the, you know, the, What are you doing specifically in the campus ministry? But it's been awesome. So thank you so much for choosing to come to Tucson just voluntarily and uh, just call me out of the blue saying, hey, we're thinking about coming there. You know, and it, it was a huge, huge blessing. So all the best to you in the future. Uh, wherever you go, Turkey, that would be so awesome. Yeah. And we're going to absolutely support you guys. And, uh, you know, always commend anyone who wants to go overseas. We, yeah, we spent absolutely. 10 years in Japan. We go, we love that spirit and that heart. And I think that's why it's been so, so great to have you guys because you have that 
commitment to missions anywhere, domestic or foreign. So mm. all the best to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining the Rob Skinner podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please hit the subscribe button and let your friends know about it and how to find it. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.